Thank you. There we go. We can start. Excellent. So welcome everybody. My name is Carolyn. I'm the Peer Connect Coordinator at Muscular Dystrophy New South Wales. Um, and we have a whole program of events all online at the moment, but hopefully in the in the coming year we will be able to open back up and do a combination of online and face-to-face -face events because we do love getting together and um, you know, face to face, person to person, um, as much as Zoom's been wonderful um, to connect with people in the <clears throat> regional areas as well as in Sydney. So it's been really good. And, and, you know, I guess it's been great also checking in with people because we are so stuck at home um, for the last little while. So um, it's great that we've been able to have this technology and it's, it's helped us continue our work. So welcome and thank you for coming along today. I'd like to officially welcome and thank the to um, lovely people from the MDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. That's a mouthful. Um, it's Christine Reagan and Christy, I was going to call you Kirsty there, Christy Gilbert. <laughs> Thank you. You probably get that all the time. Um, I do. And, yeah, we really appreciate your time and the enthusiasm to come and talk to our community about the work of the commission and how, um, you know, what that means for us as, as service users and people in the community um, keeping our eye on the quality of disability services and and potentially using them as well. So, yeah, we might go around um, and hear just from everyone that's in the room. Ellie, I'm going to start with you because you're on my top left corner, which is always a good place to start. Hi, Ellie, how are you doing? Hi, thanks, Catherine. So, yeah, my name's Ellie. I live in Holsworthy, which is out at um, Sydney Southwest. Um, I'm on Durrawal land. Um, I have SMA type two. Um, I'm busy with a lot of committees, council committees, um, disability committees, animal committees, um, very big into the environment and animal welfare and I'm running for elections. You probably yes, Ellie, Ellie is running for a council elections on December 4th, so we all have Yay. to, you know, send her a bit of a positive, uh, yeah, wishes. It's exciting, Ellie. Very Thank you. Yeah, yeah, check her out on Facebook. Yeah, we'll put the link in the in the chat, so if you want to Thank you. add that in, Ellie, that would be great. And Ellie's one of our um, wonderful participants and contributors to the Peer Connect program and to all of the work of Muscular Industry, and you've been involved for a long time, Ellie, and you're a a service user, you employ your own your own people to care yeah. for you at home, and yeah. So Ellie's um Ellie's a really great person to to yeah. be able to know about this stuff, to spread the word as well as for her own information. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Ellie. Do you want to pass the baton to someone else in the room? Yeah, I think I'll hit it to Andrew. Thanks, Ellie. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Great, Andrew. Welcome. Andrew, I live in Redfern, so I'm a Gadigal nation. Um, I have a limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, I'm a painter, as you might be able to see from the back of my studio. Oh, that painting you sent me the other day, Andrew, was absolutely amazing. Thanks. Um, beautiful, beautiful work that you do. Wonderful. Yeah, awesome. And just for the context for the guys from the commission, Andrew, you use services well in, to support you at home on a daily basis, I suppose? Yeah, I'm a power wheelchair user, like 14 hours a day. I have services three times a day. So um, totally dependent on support workers yep, for um, uh, five hours a day in total. Yeah, so a fair bit. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Do you want to pass on to someone else? Um, yep, uh, Christine. Oh, that's me. Um, is, uh, can everyone hear me? Yep. Yep, yep. okay. Um, I've had a long career in disability advocacy <clears throat> and policy. I've worked with Carolyn in about three or four jobs each, I think, haven't we? Um, We're following each other around, Christine. <laughs> I suspect we are. Um, but also I my best qualification for this work is that um, I have a daughter with Down syndrome who is an NDIS participant. She's given me permission to share bits and pieces about her, so that's quite okay. She is both my motivator and my teacher, so she's the one that keeps me grounded and, and very much brought me to this 
world, except that I was also raised with a sister with a completely different disability. Um, I've worked in um, at NCOS, New South Wales Council of Social Service, for a couple of decades um, in policy, disability policy. You're I did work in. Making yourself sound so old, Christine. <laughs> uh, I think I'm pretty old. <laughs> my, no. my, my, my children, no, that's right. My children would say. Um, I'm actually in Penrith, so I'm on Darrick country. Um, I've worked for the Anti-Discrimination anti Board in New South Wales, the New South Wales Ombudsman as well. Before I came into the commission where I originally started as the State Director for New South Wales and ACT, and then went on to this role in engagement, which is the stuff that lights up my heart. So um, it's a pleasure to come and talk awesome. to you today. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. That's that's great. Would you like Maybe to Christy. <laughs> yeah, Christy might go next. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Christy Gilbert. Um, I am new to the disability sector. I joined the NDIS Commission uh, with Christine when she came over to this engagement role in November last year. My background is predominantly working in uh, marketing, stakeholder engagement and communications. So my key role is to work with Christine on outreach to NDIS participants to pull all these kind of things together. Um, Which is exactly what you're doing today, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Fancy so, that. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. So that's what I'm doing. So I'm on, now this one's a tricky one because I thought I was on Darug uh, land as well, but my children tell me I'm on Darawal. Um, I'm at Reevesby Heights, so not far from you, Ellie. Um, so I better clarify that because the kids talk about that at school. And that's my next warning. I have three children that are getting, uh, they're on school holidays at the moment. That, that They're all off gaming. But if we get a little interruption, I apologise in advance. <laughs> yeah, when they can't find the chips, they'll be there. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Or the internet goes down. That's the biggest disaster. <laughs> Thanks, okay, um, great. maybe over to Laura. unmute myself before I start talking. Um, yeah, my name is Laura. Um, I've just started a new role as a client services coordinator with MD New South Wales, which I am very excited for and enjoying so far. Um, I also work part-time with Higher Up um, as a individual support worker, which I find really rewarding. And I, I definitely love their approach as far as very much person-centered in, in everything they do. It's not just a ticker box, it's the whole uh, vibe, so to speak. Um, yeah, so I, that's about me. Um, and very keen to hear a bit more about the Quality and Safeguards Commission today. Um, I'm also in the um, Campbelltown area, so on Darawal land, like Ellie shared. Awesome. So, Laura, there's only a couple more people. Do you want to pick somebody? Um, who haven't we heard from? There are the people that aren't on. I might just throw to Joan because I'm not sure who else is. Yeah, really yeah, yeah. Thanks, Laura. No worries. Um, I also uh, work for Muscular Dystrophy New South Wales and hopefully work for our community. Um, I um, am on Gadigal land. So, Andrew, you and I, although we're not close together, we're both on, uh, on Gadigal land. And uh, I'm really interested in hearing from more from the commission so that we can provide that sort of information and support to our members when they have issues um, to know more about the processes for uh, following through and supporting people who are not um, happy with services or, or want to provide feedback to the commission. <clears throat> so I might throw to you, Yas Yasna, are you? Um... Yeah, Yasna's audio is not connecting and um... Yasna did let me know that she had a funeral service at 10.30, so I suspect that that is still continuing and she's sort of gotten okay. in but not quite ready. So we might okay. come back to Yasna when she... Yeah. Can I throw to you then, Lisa? Are you um, are you ready to chat? Hi, everyone. Um, yep, my name's Lisa. I live up here in um, Newcastle. Um, what else do we... What are we talking about? Just introducing ourselves? Yeah, yep. just intro, Lisa, and... Um, Oh, yeah, you can explain that you're busy and double yeah, multitasking sorry. as well. <laughs> I'm multitasking on two calls at the moment. I'm on two meetings. So, um, yeah, I'm from Newcastle. I've been around for a while. Um, I have muscular dystrophy myself, um, and I also work for the NDIS, which is interesting. So, um, 
Yeah, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing what's happening today on this end of it all. Oh, good job, Lisa, and well done on the multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm multitasking. Well, three things happening. <laughs> awesome. So we might go to Andrea. Are you there, Andrea? I'm not too sure if you're um, busy or if you're if you're with us. Oh, oh. oh hi, hi, Andrea. Hi, hi Andrea. Hi. Hi everybody, sorry I'm going to have to be in and out. Um, my name's Andrea, I am in the far north of New South Wales on Bundjalung land. Um, I am a mum of a child with a uh, disability, he's going to be 16 this year. Uh, Is he really? <laughs> oh gosh, Andrea. <laughs> And Caroline, he won't be able to spend that birthday with you like his sweet 16. So I'm really sad about that. <laughs> You've missed oh, his last two birthdays. I can't believe that. <laughs> I know. It's crazy, isn't it? He's just getting so big with a very yes. deep voice. Um, <laughs> yes. For, the, for those people who don't, don't um, get what Andrea's talking about is Sam always comes to summer camp. Summer camp usually is at the end of December and that we usually have the opportunity to celebrate with Sam on his birthday during camp. That's right, yep, yep. This year yep. camp is going to be to the end of January, so we're going to miss celebrating Sam's 16th birthday with him. Yeah, you are. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, and I'm just looking forward to finding out more information. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm probably going to have to leave the meeting because I've got my other child to get to work. Um, so I'm rushing in and out. So. Oh, that's okay, Andrew. We're actually recording the, the meeting, so you know we can send you the link for that later. So That'd be great. you know, if you ever get a spare minute, you can you can check out anything you missed. So That'd yeah, great. Thank no, you. We're just so glad to see you again and say hello to Sam for us, and uh, hopefully we'll see him in January. <laughs> he's eating his breakfast. He's a teenager. Just got up. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's pretty early, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's a bit early actually. It's normally midday. <laughs> Yeah, well, it is school holidays, so yeah. That's um, true. <laughs> yeah, great. Lovely to see you, Andrea. Thanks. You too, Caroline. Excellent. And then we've got Yasna, who's as well as what I explained. So I think that we've met everybody in the room. So I might pass over to Christine um, and Christine for their presentation. And we wanted to make today a bit of a QA and a so that we don't, um, you know, go, go for too long. People's, you know... I guess attention span on Zoom is not as, as great as it could be. And I think we all have a little bit of Zoom fatigue. But um, so if we can try and make it, you know, quite relevant to people using services and, you know, you guys um, have a lot of great resources. So perhaps we can also share those links and, and things as well. But, yeah, we'd love, love to hear about the role of the commission and, and you know, what it's doing to, to make services better and what people can do when they are not happy or not, you know, having problems or issues. So over to you guys. Thank you. Um, I'll kick off and I'll, Christy does have to get away as well, unfortunately. So it might actually be me or it might be Christy. What time are we finishing up, Carolyn? Um, we usually don't go past 12.30. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, that's, people, that's good because like, that's what I know. expected. So if we can finish a little early, then that's um that's yep. a goal, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's really. Great. And you know, we're through a recording. We don't want to make it too long because people won't want. That's it. right. So. <laughs> I I do have some um slides which I'd like to go through because they'll just shape what we say, but I won't spend a lot of time on them because we can send them out afterwards and just as a memory aid as well. So yeah. how does that sound? Okay. Yeah, so I'll just share my screen now. So uh, if but I make please, co-host, is that? I uh, should be able to just share. No, no, no. You, no, you need. Yep, okay. No, you need to make me a co-host, please. Yeah, I thought so. You can just enable sharing. It's up to you, Carol. Whatever's okay. easier. I'll just say yes to that. Hopefully, that's okay. Here we go. Good. Um, and I'll just share that. Can you see that now? Yep. yep. Okay, because I can't see it, so I'm just going to, I can see it on my other screen. I'll just take that to the beginning. Does that make more yeah, sense to you now? Yeah, that looks good now. <laughs> good. Good. We only have a few um, people on board, so please interrupt with questions. And what I'll do then is either answer them or say, look, we're getting to that, if that's okay. Is that all right with everybody? That's sure. a good idea, because it's good to ask good. questions as we're talking about the topic, isn't it? 
that's right. You might forget. <laughs> that's that's exactly right. So that's who we are, Christine and Christy from the commission, and we'll refer it to it as the NDIS Commission. We don't have to say the whole name because it is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and just quickly about the commission, um, of course, it's there for quality and safety because there's a bit of a clue in our name. We register. NDIS providers. For any of you who've been using um, the NDIS for some years, previous to this, the NDIA used to register, but now we register providers. Um, this will be the first time we've got some national consistency. And as a matter of fact, Western Australia joined the Commission in December last year, and that was the, the final state to join. So it's only really been national since December last year. However, it started in New South Wales and ACT, and so we hit the ground running, and I know that because I was there on the first day. Uh, we help providers meet their obligations, identify problems. We'll focus on complaints and when something goes wrong. And, of course, we're looking at continuous improvement as well. Um, I'd like to do a little focus on the code of conduct because that's critically important and underpins the work that we do. Um, we regulate all providers who deliver NDIS supports and services. So basically, if you receive NDIS dollars for supports that you provide, or if you're a participant that pays someone, they're covered by the NDIS code of conduct, whether or not they know it. So it's really important people know. Um, as a mother, I was really thrilled to see uh, respect some of these new codes, for example, the principles, respect for individual rights and self-determination. At last, that's been something that's very much lagging behind and we take that very seriously. Respecting privacy. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I found when my daughter was born, there was no such thing as privacy for my daughter or for any of us. So now I'm really pleased to see that in there. Of course, act with integrity, honesty and transparency. And for your information, we have a very wide definition of that and not too clear so that we have a bit of movement to be able to talk to providers when something's going wrong. We deliver so we we expect services to be delivered safely and competently. Um, of course, we're there to ensure quality and safety. Um, and as well, we expect providers to prevent and respond to violence, neglect, abuse, exploitation and sexual misconduct. I'll explain some of these a little bit more. It's really important, though, to know that the Code of Conduct applies, applies to all providers and workers in the NDIS. Um, we're hoping it'll shape the behaviour, of course. In fact, we say to providers... It's not that you get complaints because, let's face it, we're in human services. We say to providers, if a provider comes to me, for example, and says, oh, we've got it together, we don't really get complaints, that's a red flag for me because things go wrong in human services. The measure of a, the quality of an organisation is how it responds to some of those complaints. So that's really interesting to us. Um, and please be aware that anyone can complain, neighbours, other services, something that you see that's happening to someone else if it's concerning enough. It doesn't have to be the participant. It can be anyone can raise an issue about a breach and we monitor compliance. We often get asked the difference between unregistered providers and registered providers, particularly by people who are plan managed or who are self-managed. Um, under un, If you're an unregistered provider, you're still covered by the Quality and Safeguards Commission we will use the code of conduct to take an action and to create expectations for you as a worker or an organisation. And we require that every organisation that provides supports and services under the um, NDIS has an available, accessible and understandable complaints process that is available to all the people who use that. Um, and if they want, they can opt in to opt to the worker screening. I'll explain a little bit more about that. But if you are a registered provider and you're in a lower risk services category, um, you must be part of the worker screening. You must also do reportable incidents and restrictive practices. And I'll explain a little a bit about each of these, not a lot, a little. And the way that you get um, registered is through a verification process against the practice standards. If you're really interested, I'm thrilled at the way the practice standards are written. They're forever being upgraded, uh, but the practice standards, each practice standard starts off with an outcome for the participant first. 
and then the practice standard and then the quality indicators which say how what a service needs to do to meet the standard. But it all starts with um, the outcome for the participant as the guiding principle for each practice standard. If you're a registered provider for a high risk service, of course, the code of conduct, of course, the complaints process, you must be part of worker screening, you must report incidents, you must have a restrictive practice reporting, but the certification process to be registered is much more involved and will require an independent audit and speaking to the participants as well. Now, did someone have a question then? No, I'll keep going. I, I, I kind of have a question, Chris. Sure. Um, so a, a few of us self-manage or, um, you know, perhaps self-organise our supports from different places, some registered providers, some unregistered providers. So you're sort of saying that the NBIS Code of Conduct, um, which is a list of, you know, those kind of things that you were just talking about, and there's a really good training module, those mm. apply to any worker Everyone. from anywhere that's doing support for you if you're that's, paying that's, them through the NBIS. That's, that's exactly right. And that's okay. really, really important. In fact, Carolyn, um, as State Director, the very, very first banning order that happened in New South Wales was against a worker in an unregistered provider um, using the code of conduct. So we will use the code of conduct against unregistered providers. Um, and can you, against it, can you, Chris, can you give us an example of why you would have banned a service? Like it, make it a little more real for people? Like why would you ban, why would you ban a worker or a service? Well, there's a whole list of, of compliance actions that we've taken on our website so you can look it up. But we would ban workers, for example, for um, incompetent service or deliberately criminal service. For example, everyone heard about those uh, providers. There were six provide a set of six providers in Operation APIS um, that the police undertook. And they found with the NDIS, the NDIA, that they were ripping off and charging people against their plans, lots of times without their knowledge or too frightened to speak up. Mm -hmm. um, and then we actually banned all of those. So that's the kind of thing. We could ban a worker for, oh, another really good example is the Anne-Marie Smith matter last year in South Australia, where a woman was left in a chair for 18 months um, and that wasn't found until she passed away. Um, not only did we ban the worker, but we also banned the provider in that case and the worker is about to be sentenced. So those are the kinds of, that's at one extreme end. And there's a whole pile of other things that I'll explain a little more about, Carolyn, just so you get yeah, the whole... Good. I'm just trying to think of, yeah, examples of, you know, making... Making all of oh, these things, you know, mean something to, to all right. Well, what, real what life that's, experiences. Yeah. yeah, what I'll do when I get to what actions can we take, I'll give you one or two other examples of the type yeah, cool. of thing that we might do. Yeah, no, um, that's, that's helpful. Thanks, Chris. Worker screening is really important. And frankly, as um, uh, the supporter of a participant, I'm really pleased to see this. We all know in the past where a worker might have done the wrong thing or been really incompetent or been a bit dodgy, um, then they might get sacked from a workplace or exited, depending on what language you use. And then they might go to the next suburb or the next state or the next region and get a job in disability supports. So, this way, um, workers are all registered with us. They have to have their state uh, clearances that are required for their work. That gets logged with us so that if Christine Regan does the wrong thing in New South Wales in a disability service and I move to Victoria and I am employed by a provider in Victoria, then if I've done a breach, then that will show up and I will not be employed. Oh, that's um, excellent. Or, that's, that's good. Or many, many workers, as you know, work for more than one employer. But I might do a breach in one and then that will be flagged to the other employers of that worker. So it's not perfect, but it's certainly a better coverage than we've ever had before. It started in February this year and the Northern Territory started from just this July. So it's really, really new. Reportable incidents is really another safeguard for people. 
uh, providers must notify, investigate and respond to reportable incidents um, about the NDIS participants. Now, this is in connection with their support and services. So if a participant is at home and or they're visiting some, a friend and something happens between the, the visitor and the friend, that would not involve us unless they were at the same time being supported by a worker. If they weren't being supported by anyone, that wouldn't be our thing. But if most, you know, most people who are using services, there could be a connection and this might be an extra safeguard for them. They must report to us about the death of a participant. And uh, previous to this, Carolyn, you'll know that reportable incidents only covered the deaths of people in supported accommodation. The Commission has expanded that and it's all deaths of people with disability in relation to their supports and services. Any serious injury, any abuse or neglect, and we take quite a wide view of what could be abuse and neglect. Any unlawful sexual or physical contact, including um, where there's no consent. Um, sexual misconduct, including grooming, which is a really good thing to see. It's a hard thing to find, but it's a really good thing to see there. And unauthorised use of restrictive practice. Sadly, we have to say every time I show this, this form, um, we are not first responders at the Commission. It's really important to first go to the police, to the ambulance, to the fireys, whoever you need to go to, and then let us know within the appropriate time frame. We did have... Uh, uh, Car I'll say Car Carolyn, uh, but I'm talking to everyone, excuse me. Um, we did have a matter where the workers had just done their um, requirements. They were so intensely aware of what they had to report and who they had to report to uh, when a matter came up when there was a tragedy at a house and they called us before they called the police or the ambulance. So we, we are saying we are not first responders. Yeah. Please go to the first responders. Yeah, I think Ellie, um, Chris, if you can, i will stop you there for a sec. Ellie's got a question. Uh, yes, yeah, thanks, Carolyn. Um, Christine, does can we check um, individual workers? Like I employ my own workers, I directly yeah. employ them. If yeah. I say hire Mary, for example, yeah. and she said she's worked before as a carer, I take her on. Is and she's done something bad is how do I find that out is that something that's reported and uh, something that I can find out or you would be able to, you'd be able to find out if if you're a self-managed participant I'm assuming or a plan yeah. managed participant yeah um you you can check the worker screening by opting in um but that means that you would need to have your workers um, register, uh, make sure that they've got their appropriate clearances and then register with us. Um, but then you could also check um, whether or not that person has had previous breach. And now, the way I, you might... Yeah. I, I, I can't give you that process right now. I can get back to Carolyn with that process if you prefer, or you could go to our website and look it up. But I'm quite happy to get back to Carolyn with that if you like. Oh, yeah, we, we can do that because what we'll do yeah, after yeah. today is send around notes and, and um, you know, any kind of questions that can't be answered now. So, yeah, Ellie, good. we can get that information for you. But I think the answer is is yes, as long as they're, is it that they have to be registered, Christine. Because if they're no, not the, registered, then how does Ellie check? There, there's no way of checking. No, them. no, no, no. Self-managers no? can check worker screening. Because remember, we did say if they're not registered, they can opt in, and that's available to self managers. Okay. Yeah. Well, that sounds so, good. Yes, because it's not it's fair. They're bit encouraging. It's a bit complicated, isn't it? Registering and opting yeah. in and all of these things that we don't really know what they mean, you know? Yeah. It's, abs it's absolutely not simple, but if you work through the steps, it need not be as complicated as it sounds. So it's just knowing what you need to know and then working through the steps for those things, but also knowing where you can find out information, which we'll make sure we have available to you after the session. Okay, so yeah, that's can great. I? Okay, good. Yeah, and the other is that, is is that okay, to... Ellie? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. I'm still a bit unclear, but yeah, I'll see what what provide later. In. Yeah, so <laughs> the, short answer, the short answer is yes, you can check, um, and we'll send you the process that you can go through. Okay. Good, thank you. Yeah.
-hmm. And just to, to add to that, so that's a separate process to a police check, isn't it? Yes. Yes, yeah. it is. So we're talking so, about something in addition to that. But what, that's what, right. if, the, what if the person, that the worker, had done something dodgy but no one knew about it because that they weren't registered or reported? Like, well, look, well that's the same that as counts, life. That's the same as life, isn't it? Because we yeah. can't. You know, so There's it's a no matter of, of a perfect person. Yeah. And that's why I said, even though we have worker screening, which is a really good um, system, which never existed before, and that's a national system, it's not perfect yet. And of course, pe dodgy people will do dodgy things and get away with them. So it's also good to get recommendations and to see previous um, workplaces, etc. But that's up to the participant. Yeah, references and, and yeah, using your own questioning and character judgment. And, and also I think yeah. I think going with your gut helps too, you know, because very often your gut's right. Um, yeah. that's not that's not a safeguard, but you know, that's just something that you you don't pick someone that you're really not comfortable with. Um, and even if you don't know why. But anyway, we'll keep keep moving on if that's okay with everyone. I did just want to jump in the sure. similar to the working with children check and the police check, the NDIS screening does cost money for the support worker. So I'm not sure whether that's something that, you know, if you might have people go, oh, yeah, well, I'm just waiting until I get paid to do that. Obviously, that's something to be wary of, but it is something that costs them that's money. Right. So that may be a barrier in that that's why they haven't done it as well it could yeah, also be that they not, don't want to be on the screening because they've done something wrong but just yeah yeah it's it's not that expensive Ellie so really uh, you might decide to employ someone for a matter of weeks but if it's I have to wait till I get paid before I can even apply part of the deal is this is like you you can't be you can't be a nurse or a doctor or a health professional without some of your qualifications and that costs money. So it's all part of the process, really. Mm. I don't think it's unreasonable to have this as an expectation. In fact, no, I it's have the one. same cost as the working with children check. I think it's about $80. So yes, that's you right. Can, it, you that's can that's claim it as a tax. Um, yep, you know, you yeah, you can. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I have less energy for that kind of excuse, I have to say. Uh, I will be a bit flexible, but I have less energy mm. for that. Um, um, Chris, we just also yeah. have a new person come into the room. So, Francis, oh, good. I think, um, if, if you can hear us, Francis. Hello. Francis is there, but she's on mute. So, we'll ask. Okay. Yeah. Welcome to Francis. Um, and Francis can pick up um, and maybe talk to the others as well. I'm Christine. I'm okay. from the NDIS Commission. Thanks. Um, yeah. Good to hi, hear Francis. from you. Yeah. Hi, Francis. Hi. Sorry, I'm late. Um, no problems at all. We're just about to talk about complaints. Um, as I said, NDIS participants have the right to complain about the quality of their supports and services and about their safety as well. Um, they have a right to feel safe in their services, but rem reminding you that anyone can complain. Neighbours can complain, family and relatives, friends, other service providers, other organisations, anyone can complain to us about um, something they're concerned about in relation to an NDIS support and service. Um, and on that point, if you're not sure whether or not it's us and you want to raise it with us, we can do three things. We can, if it's not us, we'll let you know and we can let you know who the right body is. Uh, we can perhaps assist you to get there if you need a bit of support to get there, or we can take it to the other body on your behalf, depending on what your required, you know, what your own requirements are. So we don't just turn people away if it's not us. Um, uh, again, we sort of like to hammer that every NDIS provider, whether or not they are registered, must have effective complaints management and resolution arrangements, and they must be available to the people who use their services and understandable to the people who use their services. The NDIS Commission will take complaints about providers. Um, we take them all complaints that come to us seriously and we assess every one of them. Um, we often have a facilitated resolution process because many, many complaints are about a communication breakdown and our involvement somehow seems to smooth the way. That's not all of them, of course, but very often better communication. Um, and some complaints require investigation 
which we can require the organisation to do. We can require them to um, engage an independent investigator or we might even investigate it directly ourselves. Um, we decide, we always say that complaints and other feedback are a way for providers to improve their service delivery and that's how it should be seen, as I said earlier today. Are there any questions? Oh, I've got another slide on complaints, which I'll go through, and then I'll ask if there are any questions about complaints because I am doing it quite high level. Um, we assess issues raised in each complaint to look at the best way forward. Um, please be aware that we do have our, our legislation both enables us to do a, a comprehensive and reasonable job. It does, but it also places some limits on us. Um, the complainant, we always ask the complainant what they're looking for, what resolution they're looking for. Some resolutions, I want everyone banned or I want so-and-so fined or something, may or may not be the right outcome, but we will certainly take it all very seriously. Um, the process could include speaking to the complainant, speaking to the provider. We will always seek the views of the person with disability involved in the issue, except where there's a good reason or a compelling reason not to, and that happens occasionally. Um, we might educate a provider about their obligations. We might facilitate meetings or offer formal conciliation. Uh, we might ask for explanations and or more information, and we could require providers to take specific action, and that might be. Um, and here I just want to explain, as Carolyn suggested that I do, what happened in a particular matter, for example. We had one matter where there was a tragedy in... Uh, a house, um, and this was in a supported accommodation house. Um, for that, provide that uh, the the uh, matter was reported to us because that was a death. Um, however, um, the mother wanted to make further complaints about not only that, but a whole pile of things. Um, then she decided that she did not want to take the complaint any further. We were so concerned behind the scenes about some of the issues that were raised, we took it further on our own recognizance. And in fact, that provider, which was a large-ish provider of supports, um, had to then do several things within a very short time, which cost them quite a lot of money. They had to not only review the circumstances of the tragedy, but they then had to do an environmental review of every facility or house. And by facility, I mean some of the centres where they might have done day programs or art classes or whatever they were providing, as well as any of their supported accommodation houses. Uh, we also required that all epilepsy and all behaviour support plans were immediately reviewed. Um, and so we took a, a lot of action with this provider behind the scenes. We ended up taking a compliance action against this provider as a result of that work, despite the fact that the complaint was withdrawn. Just for your information, there are three ways that you can make complaints. You can make a complaint just directly. Um, you can make a complaint as an anonymous uh, complainant. That means that we won't take your contact details, um, but it also means we won't be able to report back to you the progress or the outcome of the complaint. We can take a complaint and you for you to be a confidential complainant, and that will mean that we will not disclose your contact details or who you are to anyone that you haven't given us consent from. Be aware, however, that our... Um, the law requires us to make certain disclosures in certain circumstances. If we were required by law to disclose those details, we would first get in contact with the person. The other thing that I like to mention here is that there are very strong safeguards against retribution for making complaints. In other words, we make it very clear at the outset of a complaint that we will be ensuring that there is no retribution or response action by the provider simply because the person has made a complaint. So we take that very seriously. We can also encourage people to involve an advocate if they want to, um, and we can give them some detail about that. We like 
participants who who got issues to yes. first raise them with the uh, directly with the provider if they can. But we know in lots of cases people can't, or they may have already done that and still not be satisfied. So then they can come to us. That gives you a very broad but quite deep explanation of our complaints process. Are there any questions at this stage about complaints? And I'll keep talking. Um, so if, if something occurs to you a little later, you can. But is there anything right now that occurs to anyone? Can I just ask, Is who is eligible to make a complaint anyway. on Absolutely. behalf of a participant? Um, okay. If you see some wrongdoing, it doesn't have to be on behalf of anybody. Okay. If you're making a complaint as an agent for the participant, mm -hmm. we would require that you had the consent of the participant. So there's a fine line between I'm seeing what's happening to that person and that's not okay and I need to raise it with the service or with the commission either way or this is happening to a participant and the participant's really upset about it and they won't take it forward, so should I you have to decide on the circumstances of each matter or each incident. Um, but if it's just wrongdoing, you can raise that with us. But be aware, if you're a third-party complainant, we can't give you the same progress of the, of the complaint or the same outcome of the complaint without the consent of the, of the participant. So we would report that back to the participant rather than you, but we might give you a broad response like, that we've now closed the matter or something like that because of privacy concerns. Yeah, Does no, that, I, I just, I cool? work with um, uh, clients that are nonverbal. And so that level of obviously people needing to advocate for them when they can't necessarily clearly give consent. Um, yeah, no. Just yeah, there's, we see there's a very big difference between can't give consent and not use spoken language. Because there are, as in my experience, there are very, very, very many people who do not use spoken language um, but can still give consent. And there I are do others... understand that. The example yeah. I'm thinking of, that's not within her capacity. Okay. But, yes, I do understand yeah. there's a spectrum. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So if, if for example, that person could, was unable, did not have capacity to give consent, uh, please raise. Um, now, if they have an appointed guardian, that might be where you get the consent from. Um but it, and I'm talking about adults here, of course. Um, so it just depends on the actual circumstances. If you're concerned or uncertain, you can just give us a call and ask us, really. So that might even help too. Um, is, does that help? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so how to make a complaint. Um, we encourage people to bring complaints and concerns, but we want them to go, if they can, to the provider first, if even if they're just not comfortable doing that, they can come to us. Um, but it's really good to go first to the source if you can. Um, we accept complaints 1800 numbers, um, and it can be through our website. If you require support to do that, we encourage advocates. When we're talking directly with participants, we always say we recommend and encourage you first to talk to someone you trust about it because. The idea of raising issues is often scary um, and often a bit intimidating, and it's good if you've got someone on your side. So talk to someone you trust, um, and maybe together, uh, particularly if they're uncertain or um, un unable, then that might be a way to also bring their complaints to us. So what does happen if something goes wrong, which was a really good question right up the front? Um, we have a range of, of responses that we can take. This is the first time across Australia um, these kind of actions could be taken against disability service providers. There was bits and pieces of some of these in various states and territories, all a little different. Now, under NDIS, <coughs> we can take all of these in all the states and territories in Australia, depending on the matter itself. Um, so I'll go through. We have uh, three domains. We don't need to know about those, but we'll generally work with providers. We could provide training or information, but we can ultimately ban NDIS services. We can also ban NDIS workers, or we could even ban key personnel in an organisation. 
Um, for example, a way that we've done that before is where key personnel refuse to provide appropriate um, supervision to workers. So the workers, still something went wrong, but it was more a systems issue than the workers issue, then we could ban particular key personnel or several key personnel, or we could ban the whole organisation if they wouldn't get their act together. I've got to say, as a former uh, New South Wales uh, State Director, because New South Wales has been in it for over three years now, I was running out of energy for education support, particularly um, when Providers have been around for many years, so they really should know this inside out. I might be a little bit more understanding for a brand new provider, but they are required um, to know what their requirements are and what their obligations are under the NDIS. And of course, they're covered by all other legislation that also covers all other citizens. So we can start off with education. We can impact their registration so if they're registered services, and most are, we could put conditions on their registration or we could um, uh, affect, We could make the registration audits much more often or we might actually um, then use the audit to look for very specific things. For example, um, in the Anne-Marie Smith matter, um, before we were able to ban them, we were able to, oh, we banned that particular organisation. But because it did show that there could be a gap in the system, we then went back to every other provider that was a sole provider to a sole person uh, who lived in their own home and put additional uh, conditions on their registration so that there were extra safeguards for people who lived alone with a single provider. Um, and that's something that we did across the NDIS board. We can also issue compliance notices and enforceable undertakings. They are legally recognisable agreements between the provider and the person with disability and us um, to say that certain things will be done or not done, depending on what's included in the notice or the undertaking. We can issue an injunction so that they would stop particular actions or undertake particular actions, we can apply civil penalties. That's the first time this has happened. In other words, we can fine particular workers, key personnel in an organisation or an organisation as a whole. And we were able to, in the Anne-Marie Smith case, we were able to issue a civil penalty upfront. Uh, we can revoke their registration, so we can withdraw their registration. They could only act as an unregistered provider if that um, category that they were acting in was allowable to be unregistered. So we can really, that will have a real commercial impact on them. Or we can ban them forever or for a period of time. So it depends on, of course, on the decision and what we can legally do. Um, but we have banned. And if you want to know what serious compliance actions we've undertaken, we do have a list on our website and we can point you to that. Our website's being redeveloped at the moment. I don't find it particularly manipulable, but we can send you some links to whatever you'd like to see. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on behaviour support, but we do have a positive behaviour support capability framework where people who are writing behaviour support plans now must be found suitable to write those plans. Previous to this, it was up to the various states and territories. Some states and territories had better um, requirements than others. Um, all behaviour support plans should be, uh, must be approved through their local state and territory, but then they must be registered with us, particularly if they have restrictive practices. And those restrictive practices must be reported monthly. So, um, that's something where that's an extra safeguard so that some limits to people's freedoms and opportunities that are authorised just don't go on forever. They are constantly reviewed to see if there's a better way to manage or if it's, in fact, um, continuing to be required at all. So what is an unauthorised use of restrictive Please, I don't practices? know if, if we're short for time. I yeah. don't know that that is particularly relevant in our community. Um, All right, so I'll, it I'll would be, just keep it would going be a bit then. more valuable to, to, to kind of go to, to more general and, and questions okay. and things if that's, that's okay with you. Yeah, no, no, I'm really Unless happy anyone to talk disagrees forward. and they want to hear about that. <laughs> 
it's not some um, common practices without. No, no, I'm I'm quite happy to do that. Yeah. I'm quite happy yeah. to do that. So that'll be in the slides anyway. We can shoot yeah. this slide pack through. Yeah. So. Further information is, of course, through our 1800 number. Um, of course, we have an office in every state and territory in Australia, um, so people can visit us, but we only have one office because we're nowhere near as big as the NDIA. So mostly we tell people to come in through the website or through the 1800 number, and we've got all those links as well. I just wanted to also point you to what's available to you for more information because I'm giving you the high high level light touch, but hopefully then answering some questions. We have a participant information pack. You can get copies of that or you can download the lot from our website that covers who we are and what we do, um, choosing the right supports about plan management, making a complaint and if there's any more uh, support. There's code of conduct postcards and posters um, and bookmarks and resources and magnets and things that you can get as well. For example, make a complaint about your NDIS provider. The fact sheet for that particular one is why should a person speak up? How do they speak up? How can they complain to us? What are we likely to do? Who else can they contact? Um, we also have, which we're really pushing, a safeguard newsletter for participants. Now, that newsletter comes out four times a year. It comes out in Easy Read, Auslan and 11 languages. You can subscribe to that on our website. It's designed specifically for participants and their supporters, and we're encouraging as many people as possible to sign up for that newsletter. Uh, we have a whole range of support of resources that are on Facebook. Um, they're short videos, the Speak Up resources. They're generally presented, by, well, they're all presented by people with disability and a range of different uh, disabilities so that someone might see someone they can relate to and the object there is to let people know they have rights let them know they should speak up and that we encourage them to speak up we also have a provider information pack that talks all about the requirements for providers that's downloadable from our website too if you want to see what's in that and it's got a whole pile of information about how to manage and worker screening what they're required to do renewing etc <coughs> we have resources for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organ, um, audiences, and they are badged appropriately with the appropriate um, uh, images. They're the same kind of information, but written for a particular audience. And we have some easy read resources too. You see there, there's a postcard. That postcard there of, of that woman smiling has the code of conduct on the back. I really encourage you to get some postcards with codes of conduct. Um, just make sure people are aware of their rights under the Code of Conduct when using the NDIS. Christine, I was, I was going to suggest a bookmark. Could be a nice little Christmas gift for everyone's support workers so that they can read the Code of Conduct in when they're reading their bedtime reading. <laughs> oh, now sure that's a clever idea. Make sure, make yeah. sure it's drummed into them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I, I think too, maybe just having the NDIS magnet on the fridge and not saying anything about it so that workers turn up and think, oh, this person's clued in. I've got to, got to yeah. be a little bit more careful. It, you know, it's not a threat. <laughs> That's right. It's not a threat. It's just a reminder that these are the rights that participants have. Um, we've got a whole range of fact sheets, um, and you can go through our list of fact sheets on our website. We've also got the NDIS Code of Conduct Summary for Workers, etc. You can see all of those as well. And they're in a range of formats in Braille, in other languages, in Auslan, and in Easy Read. Now we're here to questions, and I think I've done that as the fastest I've ever done that. So I hope that <laughs> Christine, that's a well light done. Touch. <laughs> <laughs> Could you stop screening sharing, and then we can see each other nice and close again? Oh, that would be much better. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And I would just like to also welcome um, Yasna is is with us now. Yasna, are you still with us? Now has that stopped? Has that stopped sharing? Yes, yes, it has. Yes, that's good. Oh, yeah. good, because I, I, I need to get, I can't see you. Let me see. Oh, there we are. Good. All right. Yeah. Excellent. Mm. Yasna's with us, but she might not be with us with us, though. That's okay. Okay. But lovely, so lovely to see you again, Francis. I, I, I'm so happy that you came in. Um, did you want to do a quick intro to you, Francis? And was there any <laughs> questions or? No, you that's unusual. You like usually like talking. <laughs> um, but I thought maybe we could just use a few minutes if anyone has any stories or, you know, to make this 
meaningfully life, you know, like real life. Um, let's, does anyone have any stories or any questions or any queries? I mean, one thing I think is really handy that you can use the commission for is sometimes you, you know, something will happen and you think, hang on a minute, is that, is that, is that okay? Or is that just me being, you know, pedantic or am I, have I got too high expectations? You can actually call the commission and, mm. you know, use their Check complaints officers to just run something by them and sound out something. Is that right, Chris? Yes, it certainly is. And, you know, we do have people where the, um, the uh, support worker uh, turns up half an hour late but still puts the whole two hours in, for example, um, and you're just a little bit uncertain about raising that or it starts off with 15 minutes just once and then ends up being 20 minutes most times and then that's unacceptable behaviour. It's absolutely unacceptable. Another thing might be that they speak to you in a way that is disrespectful. We take that very seriously. So don't think that's a light thing. You should be supported in a way that responds to you. Oh, here we go. Someone has one. Oh, Andrew, awesome. I was <laughs> I was hoping you might tell us a story or two because you're great at storytelling. <laughs> yeah, um, I um, was engaging uh, support workers through a service provider and um, um, not once, but on several occasions, they had um, shown up under the influence of drugs or alcohol to um, transfer me using a hoist to put me into bed. And not, um, not okay, not okay. <laughs> and they had told me like the following week, um, I'll give you an example. Um, I'll give you a specific example so that it's not vague. Um, support worker said, oh, look, I'm sorry about last Sunday night. I was going to a party after I was coming to you and I took a pill before I came to you and it had started to come on and that's why I couldn't work the washing machine and, and why I had trouble with the hoist and all of that. And um, so um, I actually raised that in a public forum uh, on Facebook and it got back to the service provider and um, they said to me, um, you know, you need to tell us who it was. So I told them, uh, I actually, they said to me, you need to tell us who it was. And I said, well, you know, um, can I make my complaint? You know, can we do this discreetly? And they said, oh, we won't, can, you know, we won't confront the person or anything, but we'll, you know, we, we want to investigate. Um, and I said, okay, it was person A, B and C. And then the following day, they rang me back and said, oh, we've spoken to our legal department and because you've raised it in a public forum, we now have to confront your um, support workers with the accusations that you've made. And these were like three people that I'm totally dependent on every day. Um, and so that was really, they put me in a really awkward position. And um, the three support workers just denied it and said, oh, uh, Oh no! When I said a pill, I was talking about a vitamin pill, and um, you know he didn't he didn't understand what I was saying, or you know it's, they uh, they put it back on me to say that I had misread or misinterpreted the situation. And the other two examples were like someone showing up in an Uber because they'd had too much to drink to be able to drive themselves here. Um, and what's the third one? The third person said that they were sorry, but they were really stoned from the night before, et cetera, et cetera. And anyhow, the legal, yeah, that organisation just um, put it all back on me and kind of made it so awkward for me that I uh, recanted mm. and um, that was the end of it. Mm. Yeah. And Andrew, do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions and I'll keep it general but because this yeah. is just for the for the process more than anything. I'm um, really sorry that happened to you. That's very disturbing and really worried about the woman who took, well, I assume it was a woman or man, who took the pill, um, who then got in a car and drove away possibly after they took that pill if they couldn't w use the washing machine. You know, yeah. that's um, a real concern. Um, Let alone the fact that they think they can, you know, provide manual handling and, you know, put Andrew's life in their hands <laughs> to, to safely care for him. I mean, you're... You know, when you're getting rolled on a bed, you're, you're in someone's hands, you know, with your health and safety, mm. they can easily injure you, kill you, you know, that, that, 
<laughs> That's a pretty serious thing, isn't it? That's awful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Without question, it's unacceptable. There's no way that it's acceptable. Yeah. Um, from a he said, she said viewpoint, which, Andrew, I'm sorry, that's put you in that position. There are a couple of things that you can do. It'll always be he said, she said, unless someone observes it. However, if you record what happened, they weren't able to use the washing machine, so the washing machine wasn't done. They told me that they used an Uber on that day when they, whatever, you know, each thing, you put the date and the time down so that you have a legal record of um, the, that incident occurring because the organisation could have done something a little different. They could have said, thank you for telling us, Andrew, we will now do a mandatory uh, reminder of requirements for support workers and support workers must never be under the influence and push that as part of a training session that everyone has to do within the next week or two. You know, that might have taken the sting out of it. It's not okay because the work, but depending on what you were wanting um, and to try and prevent that as well. Um, or you could have come to us and we could have taken that forward. There's no easy way to raise something, but it's critically important you do and it very often helps if you've got a trusted person alongside you or an advocate who's also working with you just so that they can take some of the heat if they need to. But what happened to you, Andrew, is simply unacceptable and the way in which the uh, provider responded to you is not okay, not good enough in our um, opinion. Just on that um whole subject what if hypothetically i had um a nanny cam or um or a um just a regular in-house security camera like people are allowed to have um and i had that um incident on camera would i be my question i guess is around the legality of recording yourself in your own home um, if you were being supported by someone else, um, I feel, and I'm not giving you a legal response now, um, uh, I feel that you would probably have to tell them that you had that happening. Um, if, however, something was recorded, yeah. you would be able to use that. Now, how that gets used in the legality, but the fact that it happened would be there on film, so it would be pretty hard to deny it. Yep. Um, and that even if it wasn't the kind of action that or outcome that you actually wanted, um, it would give good outcomes and probably solve the problem. So it might not create compensation for you, but it might mean those workers didn't have a job there or they were being supervised differently or whatever. Um, because just because it's on a Sunday night doesn't mean it's party night or Saturday night. The work that they're doing with you is real work that matters in your life and will have an absolute outcome for you. Um, so it's not a light touch thing just because it's Saturday night, oh, it's cool, we're all mates together. No. And, yes, please be cool and please be all mates together, but the work is serious and must be taken very seriously. Can I just say, Andrew, I have cameras all over my house, in the so kitchen, in, in my <laughs> living room, in my bedroom, the only place there's no camera is the main bathroom. Yeah, I've got I've got one in my kitchen, in yeah. my studio, and in my living room. And, and I let them all know. And, and they all know. Yeah, that you let them know. They, they have to plug them in and charge them up for me. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, 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 and quickly delete any incriminating information. <laughs> yeah. Look, I, I, if they know, then I think go for it. Like if that's what you want as an extra safeguard, I don't see that there would be a legal impediment if you've already told them. Uh, yeah, and to be honest, um, uh, they're turned off 95% of the time. Mm -hmm. But if, um, mm -hmm. if I have any doubts or hesitations, then I'll, I'll, I'll leave one running just to see, just to you know, see what happens while I'm in the shower. But um, um, definitely, no, I'm, I'm just more choosy now with who I um, employ and yeah. who I have in my house. And you also know that uh, particularly if you live in uh, an area where you do have some choices, you can say this worker no longer suits me, I don't want this worker anymore. 
and I don't want to be contacted by them. So then an organisation would have a responsibility to accede to your wishes because you are a customer. You're not just a service user, you are a customer. Mm. We've been wrangling with this issue about vaccination as well, Christine, because that's certainly something that's, um, you know, been impacting people when, you know, if you're using support workers that are refusing to be vaccinated. So, yeah, and I'm dealing, frankly, I'm dealing with that too. And it's really a line ball thing because we can't require people at the moment. I hope we can require people. I thought that the state government said that all disability support workers needed to be vaccinated by the 6th of September. Oh, by the, by the yeah. end of September, yeah. Um, yeah, and I've what been do told you, that in my role that yeah, I had to I be vaccinated. Yeah, I think that's right. Thank you for reminding me. I think that's correct. Yeah. Um, but do you get to see their certificates or do they just say, yeah, I've been vacuumed? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm collecting for it. I've asked them for mine or my care. Yeah. I asked them to get vaccinated and I've asked them to supply me their certificates. There was one that didn't want to do it and she's now not working for me. Because mm. mm. it's, it's your right not to get COVID, just like it's my right. Mm. And there are questions, as you know, that the Disability Royal Commission brought out earlier this week to say, why has the rollout been so slow for people with disability? But my daughter now lives in her own house supported by staff with friends and I don't want like I'm not allowed to visit her but there are staff that go in all the time to visit her and they go back to their families and my daughter is definitely at higher risk than the regular person in the street and it's not okay so if there's one that there's one of her workers who's hanging out and she's lovely but if it hangs out for much longer I'm going to be saying can you just well, you can actually just please? say that it's the law now, Chris. Yeah, so, I reckon. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, so yeah, Rather we can say you want them vaccinated. It's it's the law, like it's yeah, it's the, yeah, that's it's right. The well, government. especially especially as my daughter and her best friend had to go and do that separately, and it was hard for them to understand what was happening. So it's really really important, you know. Oh, that's right. But yeah, we, we want the we want the legislation and regulations to be um, followed. Can I ask a question to the general group as far as not so much the support worker being vaccinated, but the support worker working with other um, yeah other people with disabilities that aren't vaccinated? Is that a concern for anyone? It is a concern for me. There was I've been looking for a new carer for a while now. And there was one who sounded really, really good. She had all the qualities I needed, but she also had about three, four other clients. And that really put me off to the point where I lagged so much in doing anything about it. She just went on to other work. And I, yeah, just most of my carers, I think nearly all of them, um, only have me as their client and I like it like that basically mm. yeah I'm, I wouldn't mind another one maybe but when it starts to getting a handful because it's not just the other clients it's mm. their families and the people they come in contact That's with right. and, you know it goes on and on it's like yeah people. and then the, ex the extended answer about that is that once we open up and all our support workers are doing whatever it is that they do then then you know, we are at risk, you know. So yeah, that's yeah. another 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 seminar, another webinar, I guess, another um Well I would be hoping that they wouldn't be showering everyone else that coming contact with. So I think it's different. No, but you can get it from going shopping, Ellie. You can get it from going to the movies or the concert or a you yeah. know, things that got people are gonna live their lives, aren't they? So I know, but I think there's more of a chance if you're intimately close with someone in the locked shower room than there is if you're just sitting sure. next to them at yeah. a restaurant. Yeah, absolutely. And and I would <laughs> I wouldn't want to have a support worker who's going to people who are not vaccinated either. No way. Mm -hmm. I'm, it's hard enough for them to go <laughs> to go home and you know like yeah just yeah, it is. It's a real concern for our community. It just seemed an interesting, from my point of view, as far as, you know, not, I mean, I'm not really refusing service as other people that could do the job that I do. But if I'm saying to someone, I'm not comfortable doing your personal care because you're not vaccinated, like that's a very interesting 
but then I also have a responsibility to other people that I work with as well. Absolutely, like a, Laura. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> Yasna, hello. 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 Thanks for coming in. That's okay. Yeah. Hey. Do we have any final questions? I guess we're on quarter past 12 and Chris has, has covered a lot of information and I just wanted to make sure that if there were any other questions or um, things that people wanted to know, that this was a good opportunity. Um, what, one thing that I will say while people are having a, a couple of a last minute think um, is that we will send a list of the resources that I've reported I've referred to all the links to those to Carolyn and Carolyn can send those out to everybody. Okay. What we'll also do though is give my contact details and Christie's. Christ, unfortunately, Christy had to leave at uh, just before twelve. So, um, and and but. Remember when you ring up, you won't be talking to me. You'll be talking through the process. You'll ring our 1800 number and you'll be referred if you're in New South Wales to the New South Wales office, which is much more appropriate because they understand also the New South Wales legislation, etc. cetera. So um, you'll be dealing with the New South Wales office, but I'm happy for our contact details to be shared as just an extra safeguard or if there's some questions that they might have. Chris, who are these complaints officers that will be on the other end of the phone? What sort of backgrounds do they have? What sort of people are the, the complaint people that will take our calls? We have a range of... Oh, in first contact will be the contact centre and those are the people who answer the phones. What will happen is you'll give your information to the person. The person will take that down and send that to the New South Wales office and get someone to ring you back. And that's generally how it occurs, depending on the issue, of course, very much depending on the issue. Um, and also depending on um, how many calls are coming through at the time. So uh, so you might be put straight through to the, national, to the New South Wales office or your details might be taken. But if there are times that suit you to be rung back, say that at the same time. Don't just say, oh, okay, and think, oh, my God, they'll ring because... Whenever someone's going to ring me back, they always ring me back when I'm in a meeting or something's bad. So well, like the NDIS please don't... too. Do they ring back <laughs> on a private number too? <laughs> yeah, and, and you don't know and they won't leave a message to say it's been them. So, oh, it's just, yeah, anyway. Um, so um, so I reckon say, look, the best time to ring me is after five or after three or before two or whatever, whatever suit, you know, not on a Monday, whatever suits you. Yeah. yeah. And, and who are the, what are the, the complaint officers' oh. backgrounds? Are they um, people who've worked in disability? Are they bureaucrats? Are they who are they? Well, they're all bureaucrats because they work for us. <laughs> and I never thought I'd say that to Carolyn because most of my career, as she knows, has, has not been inside government. But I have a real stake in making sure that the commission works, not only from because professionally I want it to work, um, but also because it's right for my family and for people that I know and care about um, and we need it to operate. The people who are working for the complaints, it's not the same background. Some people come from other complaints responses or other first uh, other more in-depth relatable um, complaints mechanisms. Some people have a deep um, disability background and they can then respond to, um, to people and then they add in some of the processes. Some have actually come Thanks, from Francis. working. I'll just stop you there, Chris. Francis, oh, Francis is gone. Bye, Francis. <laughs> <laughs> and, and some people also... Uh, have worked in providers and they'll come to us from providers. So there is a mix, but we also have graded complaints officers. So for the lighter ones that might be a communication one, that'll be dealt with the people that it will be escalated up depending on the seriousness or the complexity of the complaint. Excellent, Chris. Well, I'm thinking that we might wrap up. Um, is there any other questions or anything that anyone else wants to know? There's going to be lots of information available. And one thing I can recommend and thoroughly recommend you um, get your support workers to, to view and to do it as training perhaps is the um, worker, worker orientation, orientation module. module. Now, yeah, you need video. to know. It's video. Yeah. yeah, it's 90 minutes. It's done in bite-sized pieces and you get a certificate. In fact, you can do it as well if you want to. You can log on and get it. Um, if you've been employed after 
um, a particular date in, two, I think it's May 2020, you are required to do it. If you were employed in your organisation before that, you are strongly recommended to do it. And we say that if they are in a registered service and they want to make sure that they can demonstrate to us that they meet the standards we require, a good way to do that is to make sure that all your workers have their worker orientation module certificates. But I've got to say when I did it, I did it on a Sunday separate to work just so that I could check out what we're saying and what we're what's being said and how it's being presented. And I was really impressed with it. I thought yeah, I, I thought it was I'm a really, really good with it too, Chris. Yeah. And one, and one other thing I will just drop in there is that one of our wonderful community members um, is a star in the video. So it, it is relatable to to us guys with muscular dystrophy and um, neuromuscular conditions. So yeah, we'll give a shout out to Melanie who's in the video. So thanks Melanie, wherever you are. Um, you've done a great job in, in, in that video. And it's got really good real life examples in it. That's what mm -hmm. I like it about mm -hmm. it. Um, but it's a good one. And it's and it's presented people. by people with disability yeah, rather than yeah. by others. Um, yeah. Just keep an eye out because we've got another couple going to be released um, in coming months. Oh, so good. that's a little bit Maybe exciting. we can put the uh, alcohol and drug of, um, influence um, scenario into one of those because I think that would be a really good one to do. Yeah, that it's would be a good something one. that comes up often, but I know that it is a, um, an experience of, of all of us who, you know, employ people. Um, yeah. So, guys, thank you so much for your time. Oh, for being did Jasma? Did I think Jasma had a question? Yeah. Um. Was that talked about before I came in? That module is that is that going to be? We'll, a we'll send the link. Yeah. Isn't when we send the the notes from today and today's session's been recorded as well, so you can go back and see the beginning. But we will send the link for that module. Yeah, because that's a really good one to make your um make encourage your support workers i make them do it but you know <laughs> that's just me um uh to do as you know as part of as part of their requirements and i do it i give them training time to do it so yeah so we'll pop that in the notes yes no no problem yeah um guys i have put a little survey link in the chat box if you could kindly do that survey for us um it does say pdcn they give us some mon money to help fund this program that's why it's got their name in it but it's a little short survey just to say whether this is useful or not, what kind of other topics people are after. And, you know, we, we really want to make sure that these sessions are useful for people. But mm. I'd really like to thank Chris for all her information today and for making the session, you know, contained within the time frame. Thank you so much because I know that that is very detailed. And Ellie, we will get back to you with that, um, that information for worker screening for people who are self-managing mm. and directly employing mm. staff. So that's another thing to follow up. Joan's probably written a whole heap of notes for us. So wonderful work, Joan. Thank you. And um, and Andrew, lovely to see you. And thank you for sharing your experiences. That's really helpful. And, you know, um, I think it's important, even when we've gone through something difficult, if we can continue to share that, because we never know when someone else is going through that as well, or that might help someone prevent that scenario. So yeah, Laurie, your questions were great. So everyone's done an excellent job today. I'm very pleased that we got that session up and. Um, yeah, so please do the survey and anyone else want to have a final word? We will put the link up on our website somehow and I'll remember to um, save the recording somewhere. I'll find it again. And, um, yeah, I wish you all a lovely afternoon. Have a good day and take care. It's the end of September. Can we believe it's October tomorrow? Oh, <laughs> not ready. Not ready. Yeah, not ready. Yeah. I just yeah. I just want to say thank you so much for having me. It's been a delight to talk to you. I hope it's been useful, but keep the conversation going. It's critically important because you would be leaders and you will be talking to others as well, so you can spread the word as well. That is a beautiful point. These guys are our leaders, so thank you, Chris. Mm. We really appreciate that. And thanks to everyone for your time today. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank See you, you everyone. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Thanks, Chris. Oh.